Uh, hey guys, uh, my name is Dominic Kuza. Uh, this is actually my second time shooting with Jeff. Uh, thankful for the opportunity again. Uh, looking forward to doing more work in the future. Um, right now, I'm currently just an amateur bodybuilder, uh, five foot six, weighed about 200 pounds right now. I'm 27 years old. My last competition was April of 2021, so earlier this year, uh, where I competed at the Southeastern Championships in Florida, in Orlando, and I won my classic class there and my lightweight bodybuilding class as well. Um, that looked really good. It was my best look to date. It was about 10 pounds heavier than the last time I competed, and then now, just an improvement season right now, uh, looking to do something probably the end of next year, so the end of 2022. So last time we filmed, but you were around, we talked off camera, like around 150. Yeah. So I yeah. Close to like two. About 200, so I'm about 50 pounds heavier than the last time we <laughs> filmed. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, what, what, was this a different push, like when you decided you just wanted to really get back into bodybuilding? Or? So from, so we shot in 2019, and that was, uh, that was the year I was getting married, um, and then I was taking coaching out full time at the uh, time of that. So I was just shifting my priorities a bit away from bodybuilding. Still kept up with like eating and training, uh, but not as in depth and detailed. Uh, I focused on getting the career on path, getting stable income, everything like that. Focused on the marriage, uh, all that kind of stuff. And then uh, after that was set and done, felt stable with everything and started up bodybuilding pursuing again in 2020 and then uh even with everything that went on it, i made it work <laughs> it's just great were you doing home workouts and stuff or? no luckily i had access to a gym but okay. it was uh it was okay it all worked out so awesome yeah it was a crazy year for everybody um is it hard when you are to focus on yourself when you're coaching so many people and then extra the, yeah you know focus on your own and it's extremely hard um just because like i forget about myself it's like work 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 oh shit i need to eat i need to go work out i need to go do like i need to go do what i need to do so that was a big challenge for me as a coach with such a high roster uh that's where i you know hired out and i hired my own coach just because it's like if i'm not going to tell myself to do this i need somebody else to tell me to do it um so i hired my friend cameron cheek and paul serafini who uh, actually helps me with my training still. And um, they were coaching me throughout 2020. They prepped me for 2021. And then uh, now I was doing my own nutrition. Paul was still helping me with training. And then I hired uh, Chris Tuttle now as of recently to help me with my next improvement season and then prep me for uh, 2022. Chris is a great guy, real nice guy, down to earth. Yeah. Crazy competitor, very impressive. So I, I'm pretty sure I was working with Chris when we filmed. Oh, okay. Yeah, now that I think about it, because we worked together briefly in 2019, um, and I think we filmed during that. And, uh, I'm thinking it was like fall or four. Yeah, months. and it was, a great, it was a great experience and everything. Yeah. Um, and then we stayed friends throughout it all, kept talking and everything, and I just knew it was a good fit now. Yeah, he just moved to Texas from uh, Connecticut. Yeah, I remember. They that. drove there. Yeah, I remember. <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah. I guess you're moving your house, though, right? Yeah, yeah, you have to. That's crazy. Um, so you do have a few other life changes. Can we? Oh yeah, I'm expecting yeah. my firstborn, my firstborn son. Uh, my wife is due in February, so in a couple more months. That's really exciting. So I'm pumped for that. Yeah. Um, so go ahead and tell us a little bit about your workout today, man, and about the new style of training you've kind of adjusted to. In yeah, so uh, I'm sure some people might be, you know, relative with the term uh, RIR, or repetitions in reserve. It's like the inverse of RPE. So a lot of people know what RPE is, um, where you're rating the exertion of how a set felt. RIR is just more of a gauge of like how many did you feel away from failure. Um, throughout the whole video, you'll probably see like I never take a set to failure. That's just because on this certain week right now, I'm supposed to be training with three reps left in the tank. So I'm training uh, where I can do, you know, if I could do a weight for 15 at failure, I'm stopping at 12 this week. Um, this is just a good way to 
control fatigue as it alchemates throughout the weeks. And every week, we get closer to failure. So this week's three, next week will be two away, then one, and then complete failure. And as that's going, I'm increasing volume and I'm increasing weights and loads too. Uh, one of the cool things I think about it is because I'm not battering um, so hard in a day, for people that tend to respond better to more frequency or more volume, using this method, I felt for me, helped me grow a lot because I was able to do body parts almost every other day to increase the frequency of hitting them. So I wasn't doing as much volume on specific days, rather spreading it out through the week. And I was able to hit, you know, I was doing back almost every other day at one point. But even if it was just one movement, I was still getting the frequency of hitting my back stimulating my back every other day um, and RIR allows us to do that because we don't have that huge fatigue that we have to recover from every session until we get to those failure weeks so what would you say Dom, and I don't know as much about this I'm not trying, what about like I know there's people that say oh you know we have to go to failure you know every time yeah and stuff. like what would you say to those people so I think both methods work completely um, I think one, it, it definitely needs to come down to what that person enjoys. I enjoy training like this, where I'm doing more volume, more reps, more sets, um, and they're not totally, you know, killing myself where I'm super sore, dead the next day that I don't feel like I can train. But then if you're somebody who likes taking it to that extreme where you're continuously training to failure, um, you know, that comes with less training, less volume. Uh, less frequency throughout the week because you just simply can't recover from it. So I think they both have their plays in certain parts. Um, a lot of it comes down to preference, really, I think, in my opinion. Because I have friends that train, you know, very DC style, Dorian Yates style, like that kind of style. And then I have friends that train like I do. And we both see, you know, really good results. I've done both. I've seen great results from both. But I felt that getting a little bit more frequency, getting a little bit more volume in, without completely training to failure every time, that helps me a lot. Um, but it might be different for somebody else. Okay. Do you, now do you do training for your clients? Whatever they want. Yeah, no, I do training. Um, maybe on the video, you'll see me pull out my phone a couple times. I make Google Sheets for them. And then we track, like, so I have my own Google Sheet. And I track the weight I did, the reps I did. And then my gauge of RIR, like how did that how many reps away from failure did I feel I was at? Um, which RIR's biggest downfall is that gauging how far you are from failure. Studies show that like if you put an intervention in where like a personal trainer comes in and starts yelling at you or telling you to do more, an outside influence is coming in to tell you to do more. What people think is a failure point usually ends up being five, six, seven, eight more away from failure. So gauging rir is a is a little bit tough for some people um i think you'd have to have had had the background of training to failure to get a better understanding of rir yeah i think the biggest mistake a lot of the amateur guys like your newest clients have uh, coming in the industry like just in general like a, one of the more common mistakes for athletes trying to get into bodybuilding so. um doing it really fast or putting a timeline on things like like in two years i'll be x in two years i'll be here in two years i'll be i think the biggest mistake any of these guys can make girls too um is putting a time frame on things like i have to be a pro in three years like bro that ain't gonna happen i'm just gonna tell you right now it's not gonna happen unless you're some genetic anomaly um but when you set a time limit on something it's a time frame on something you're just asking to get burned out and just not enjoy this anymore because you constantly think you have to have this done by a certain date. And I think with my younger guys and girls, that's what I try to, you know, influence them on. Like, there's no set timeline in any of this. You know, if it takes a little bit longer, it takes a little bit longer. The main important thing is you have to enjoy it. Co competitive bodybuilding doesn't make you money. It's a hobby at the end of the day. It's a very passionate hobby for a lot of people and it's not going to make you any money. So many of the young guys and girls think it's like super rich. Yeah, and see, like, like and, and, and stepping on stage, that doesn't make you any money. No. It's, you know, it's what comes with 
that. Maybe you become a more successful coach, a trainer. Maybe you become a sponsored athlete. Maybe you become something. But that is has nothing to do with actually competing. At this point now, you don't even have to compete to get to that. Um, but I think it's that's where a lot of these younger generation I mean, young, I'm 27, I'm that fucking younger I generation. Know you, I know <laughs> but, what you mean, though, like, um, 20 year olds, 21, yeah. So, under, you know, under the age of 24, 25, um, that's where I see the biggest mistake, is putting this time frame on, I have to have all these things finished, it just burns them out. They just can't hang in, they can't keep doing it, because they're just constantly burned out from it. So I yeah. Okay, Dom, so I, I wanted to bring this up, I respect you, you're a coach, you work with all these athletes, young and older, um, you know, there's been a lot of talk in the industry now with, um, you know, athletes passing away uh, because of multiple reasons. And then, like, even today I read on MD that Arnold Schwarzenegger recently came out and said that bodybuilding is the most deadly sport there is. He said, you know, four people will die in, in uh, mixed martial arts within 14 years. He said 14 die in bodybuilding in a year. So, like, what's your take on that? What do you think where things are going wrong and what's your opinion about that? So... I think you're naive to think that bodybuilding is a safe sport. Um, I wouldn't probably call it the deadliest sport. I don't. I don't really agree with that statement. But I think uh, again, you're naive to think this is a healthy sport. What we do to get into the competition shape we get into, there's nothing healthy about it. Um, again, one thing I always tell younger guys, younger girls, even my older clients, like there's life after bodybuilding you can only do this for x amount of time um and you have to take that into consideration every time you prep and then you go get your blood checked you go get all these things checked um you have to take that in consideration like am i pushing the envelope too far at this point now is it going to you know negatively impact me to the point where it's hurting my life hurting my family hurting all these things and then at that point, sit down and think for what? Like, what was the reason why you wanted to push that envelope that far? Um, you know, unfortunately, we've lost, you know, people this year, especially very, you know, well-known people, too. Uh, I think it's important to look at those situations and maybe sit back and sit and think. Like, you know, this could happen to anybody. This could happen to, you know, this could happen to me. It could happen to any of my, you know, friends, anything because we put ourselves in the position to potentially let that happen. And I think that's one thing that we have to sometimes sit back, think and like value or evaluate the risk versus reward at that point. Is there a safer approach to do things? Of course there is. Like there's like, you know, there's ways to really monitor your health throughout everything. There's ways to do all that. But again, a lot of those things cost a lot of money. They cost a lot of time. And a lot of people try to push things off like, well, I do this twice a year. I get my blood checked twice a year, or I get an ultrasound once a year. You know, you, you don't hear a lot of guys getting echocardiograms like they should be, getting calcium score tests like they should be, you know, getting ultrasounds of their livers. If their liver enzymes have been elevated for years, maybe you should get your liver ultrasound. Um, I remember thinking it was crazy. Um, I won't say the other thing, but it was a gentleman out of Texas, Dallas, and he, like, twice a year would go and get an echocardiogram. And I'm thinking, well, dude, I don't know, that seems crazy. But in his family, they had had heart issues. Yes, and, and I think that's one thing. Uh, yeah. People people forget about family history yeah. when it comes to what they're genetically predisposed to. Yeah. So just because you live this very healthy-ish lifestyle with dieting and exercise regularly and all that, you're still predisposed to a lot of things that potentially could cause an issue. Um, you know, there's plenty of guys that have like autoimmune diseases they have no idea about because they've never checked them because, you know, they just lived a healthier lifestyle to where they'd never felt the repercussions of it, but they could have had this autoimmune disease forever. That's why I beg everybody, anybody that works with me has to get comprehensive blood work done multiple times a year, not just once. And I've caught people's Hashimoto's on it. I've caught people's things that they had no clue they were suffering from. Um, which is unfortunate, but at least we, you know, you went 30 years without knowing that was even a thing. Well, I found out, it's kind of stupid, but I found out from my sister-in-law that my brother had hematomacrosis, too much iron in the blood. Yeah. And his father-in-law had it, and my brother got checked, and he was a carrier, 
But the only way to do it is genetic testing. Yeah. So I went, and sure enough, I have hematoma necrosis. Yeah, and you wouldn't even think about and it. I wouldn't know. And it's not something where you're going to get effects with it to grow older. Like, it, the actual yeah. blood can do damage to the organs. And now I just donate and whatever, and it's all good. So I think a lot of, I think well, the issue is a lot of people push it off, and they don't want to know if there's something wrong. They don't want to get it checked, because if they don't get it checked, they think there's nothing wrong. And I think that's a really bad, bad play. Um, you know, there's plenty of resources out there now that are really good with functional medicine, really good with keeping you healthy. And like, if it's your time to step back, it's a, it's a, it's a bittersweet thing. But think about the life after bodybuilding that happens. You know, and that's gonna be a longer part of your life. That's gonna be the it's longest like, part of your yeah, life. Yeah. That's gonna be hard too. Like, if you don't, I know you're 27, man, but that, I mean, I imagine that transition must be very difficult going from. Someone who's twenty, like you're twenty-seven, yeah. but when you're sixty, is it? It's got to be hard to just step back and be like that part. Oh, I'm sure it is. Yeah. But if you have the right mindset and the right direction, you'll understand that your decision is for the best of everybody. Yeah. And you can focus on other stuff you didn't want to look forward. Yeah. You'd have time to. Yeah, for sure. So that, that's my take. Um, I think you know sometimes there's just you know uneducated uses of things that probably unfortunately caused issues. Um, and I think, you know, the most you can do as an athlete is educate yourself as much as you can. Like I said, there's so many resources out there. Half of it's free. Like, you know, if you just read and do things and try to understand things that maybe your coach is telling you to do and you want to understand better, I think, I think self-education right now is probably the most important thing. And then, again, regularly checking in with your doctor even if it's not your doctor getting blood work done and having somebody read it that knows how to read it correctly that's a good way to start to keep tabs on everything and if you had a client where someone was all age, you would wait or say well we're going to switch this then or so if i ever have a, a a client who has a marker off um if it's extremely off sometimes i'll say the best thing we could do is retest in six weeks let's see if it's just something you were dieting with something was off at the time of testing even maybe let's see it again in six weeks if that's at that point then if it's out of my realm it goes to a doc if it's not i'll try to help with it as much as i can and for the most part you know everybody does really well with it and i think another thing too a lot of people should do is check your blood pressure every day I think blood pressure is probably the number one thing that rocks people's kidneys that they never think about. Because you could have really good EGFR, creatinine, you know, kidney markers on a basic CMP, but you could have chronic, consistent high blood pressure that strain your kidneys every day. Yeah. So that's another one that I think a lot of guys forget about. Yeah. What do you? I, I've never asked anyone in this man. I'm just curious for your opinion on this. So. Being that you're bodybuilding, you're lifting like with power lifters and everything. When you talk about blood pressure and stuff, I mean the amount of pressure you're putting on your body when you're lifting, like intensely like that. Yeah. Does that overall affect you think over a long period? I don't of think time? so because it's so acute. It's it's so acute, and and, and you and you should you know if your venous return and everything is pretty good, you should be able to come back to baseline pretty quickly after you take like a good amount of rest. To where blood pressure is not as super elevated but again while lifting adrenaline is going you have other hormones in your blood that are going to spike those things so it's just because it's so acute i doubt it has an effect like that but it's when that stuff's chronic and you're just in your car driving with high blood pressure that's when it starts to become you know that's i mean they call blood pressure a silent killer for a reason yeah. no i have a friend who's he's snoring he's, i helped him after so he came crash my house just because it was on his way home dude i could hear this guy snoring from two rooms away with the door closed yeah sleep like, apnea is dude, another big you one you have freaking sleep apnea he said he didn't know what it was he's 27 yeah 28. and and that's another one a lot of people disregard because they don't want to wear a mask while they, they sleep don't realize it could affect your gains or your how your body's functioning your metabolism not to mention your health issues yeah your overall like you're not getting any good sleep if you have sleep apnea yeah you know and i, I told the guy sure enough he got tested and it was bad he was stopping like 52 times an hour <laughs> or something he wasn't breathing yeah that's crazy yeah so, I don't know. Uh, what are future plans man for you uh future plans besides being a dad oh well being a dad number one i'm yeah. excited for that uh right now just improvement season still uh, i'm just cruising along right now uh get ready for another improvement 
push, and then uh, hopefully nationals the end of next year. So everything, you know, God willing, pays, you know, pans out the way it should. I'll end up competing at nationals next year. Awesome. And now, if people do want to hear you, do you have the podcast and stuff? I know you're on Instagram. Um, where can they go? I can put the links on the description of the video. But where is your podcast located? Like, where can they? So the podcast it? is just on our YouTube channel. Um, it's uh, just it's gifted performance um, is the YouTube um, and we have a we have the podcast on there it's on Spotify iTunes all that stuff too uh, but most people watch it on YouTube because we video the whole thing as well and then we have tons of exercise indexes on there a lot of podcasts uh, Q and A's are on there um, I have a series on there so you want to compete for first time competitors to kind of get a gauge for like what what's what is a contest prep what are some things i need to know um how's a show day ran things like that i have a series in there for like people who are just curious about competing um and then you know our website giftedperformance.com and we're all on there we're just we're a big team of coaches now and um we do we do a lot of different sports i know this is mainly a bodybuilding um channel but we do powerlifting tactical um we have a doctor of physical therapy on the team who does virtual visits with everybody awesome. yeah know. yeah so we have a we have a really good wide scope of uh fitness practice now not just bodybuilding anymore awesome. so like athletic training. oh yeah athletic training crossfit uh olympic weightlifting um powerlifting some strong man we have a, a woman who does tactical training she gets a lot of people ready for um, military basic boot camp, you know, people who need to get in shape for like uh, physical testing, like at FBI, police academies, things like that. She coaches those kind of people. Okay. So we have a lot of different avenues of stuff now. And you are thinking about doing, you haven't said a date yet, but a seminar eventually here in Michigan? Yeah, so uh, it'll be in December or January, that's for sure. Um, it'll be at Mind and Muscle. Okay. Um, and it's going to be uh, intro kind of based on my YouTube series of you know, I want to invite people who are thinking about competing, who maybe are novice competitors. They've only competed once. They're thinking about doing another one. And just to understand a bit more of like, you know, what is peak week, what it should contain, what it shouldn't contain, you know, how, how could you register for a show? Just run people through the basics so that they're not going into the thing completely blind. Yeah. No, that's cool, man. And a lot of other states have, like, they hold that. Like, the, the state actually holds that. But Michigan Summer had something like that. Yeah. It, it is nerve wracking. If you've been in a long time, you know everything. You've been around it, you know all the time. You know, I, but if you haven't, it's scary. Oh, you yeah. Do you don't know what anything is and how it's ran well, or anything. You have to have an NPC card. You yeah. understand all that stuff. So, like, in my YouTube series, I talk about all that. But I want to I take this YouTube series and make it a seminar for people here in Michigan. Yeah. Which I think a lot of people would benefit from. Very cool, man. Well, it was good to catch up with you. We will follow along. Um, Good luck with the, the baby, everything Thank goes you. smoothly and everything. Thank and you. And we'll catch up with you next year when you're prepping for your show. Yep, sounds good. Awesome. Take care. Doug. Thanks.